Honourable Questions, Question Oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. One month ago, the Conservatives warned the Prime Minister that there was a medic uh, medication shortage to alleviate the suffering of children, despite the fact that this medication is abundantly available in the US. Here in Canada, parents find it hard to find this medication. Drug stores, pain medication for small children cannot be found here in Canada, leaving mothers and fathers scrambling to help their suffering children. The Prime Minister has had a month since we warned him about this problem. He said he would fix the supply chain issues in our uh, medical system. Why hasn't he solved this problem? Here. The Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, we've heard from parents who are struggling to get pain medication for their kids. They're heartbreaking stories, and that's why Health Canada is taking action concretely to accelerate uh, the flow uh, of pain medication for children. We're working closely with provinces and territories as they uh, work to resupply uh, and support and resupply as well. Uh, we know this is something that is uh, part of the global disruptions of gl of, uh, that uh, climate change is facing, that uh, uh, the pandemic has left on, on supply. I'm going to ask the Prime Minister to sit down for a second. We're starting off on the wrong foot here. I think the, I think the Honourable Leader of the Opposition wants to hear the answer. The, honorable, the Right Honourable Prime Minister may just finish off the last 15 seconds. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that the pandemic has led uh, challenges to our supply chains around the world, which is why uh, we're continuing to work with partners uh, to ensure that we can uh, get the uh, things that parents need to take care of their kids. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, I guess in the meantime, Canadians will have to continue to drive to the United States where these medications are widely available for parents. But back here at home, uh, the Prime Minister's half trillion dollars of inflationary deficits have given us a 40-year high in inflation. Now they're driving up interest rates, inflationary taxes, including the Prime Minister and NDP plan to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax, a threaten to force Canadians to turn off the heat during winter. Tomorrow is the fall economic update. Will the government commit today to freezing spending and freezing taxes? Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, through the difficult times of the pandemic and now as families are faced with uh, uh, rising prices on so many different things, uh, we have been there to support them. We're delivering uh, as of Friday, the checks are going to start rolling out to 11 million households uh, for a doubling of the G a GST rebate that's going to help people uh, in meaningful ways. We're also moving forward on rental supports uh, and dental supports for children uh, across the country. Unfortunately, the Conservatives, despite their supposed preoccupation with the cost of living on Canadians are opposing our support for families uh, who need dental care for their kids or support for low-income renters. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Inflationist deficits uh, coming from this Prime Minister and his uh, coalition with the New Democrats. $500 billion. All this has increased the price of products that we buy and the interest we pay. Now the Prime Minister wants to triple taxes on heating, groceries and gas in order to make the situation even worse. The government tomorrow will put forward the full economic uh, update. We have a very clear request. Will the government freeze spending and freeze taxes? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives always preach austerity and cuts in employment insurance, cuts in pensions for seniors. We, on our side, will continue to be here not only to support Canadians with measures such as having a new GST tax credit or with the dental and rental assistance, measures that the Conservatives have voted against, we are also here to, func to create an economy that works for everyone with investments towards a greener and more prosperous future for all workers. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. These are the only ones protecting pensions and employment insurance against the inflation that is eating up the paychecks and the benefits of Canadians. Now, the Finance Minister is suddenly pretending to agree with me on all of this. She sent a memo that's since been leaked in which she says that her ministers will have to find savings to match any new spending in the fall economic update. It's not clear whether the Prime Minister got the memo. He still wants to continue to pour inflationary fuel on the fire with more spending 
standing still. Will he listen to his finance minister, who started to listen to conservatives, and cap spending and taxes? Yeah. Yeah. The right honorable prime minister. It's the only cold-hearted conservatives would imagine and describe sending kids who otherwise can't afford to go to the dentist to the dentist as pouring fuel on inflationary fires. Only uh, conservative politicians would consider that giving targeted support for uh, low-income Canadians to help pay for their rent would be pouring inflationary fuel on the fire. Mr. Speaker, inflation is a global phenomenon right now. We've moved forward with targeted supports for families families that will make a meaningful difference. Unfortunately, the Conservatives, for all their rhetoric, stand in opposition to help for families. The Leader of the Opposition. We stand in opposition to the policies that have sent 1.5 million Canadians right. to the food bank in a single month. We oppose a record credit card debt on which the Prime Minister's policies are now driving up interest rates. We oppose policies that have forced one in five families to skip meals because they can't afford food. And you want to talk about cold-hearted. This is the guy that wants to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax on home heating when bills are expected already to have gone up 100 percent. Why won't he cancel that cold-hearted plan and cap taxes? The right honourable Prime Minister. The price on pollution returns more money to average families in the jurisdictions in which it applies than they pay out uh, in pollution costs. This is the fact that has allowed us to both lead on the fight against climate change and put more money back in the pockets of Canadians. But the reality is, Mr. I don't know what it is today, but everybody's very rowdy. Maybe I'll let the Prime Minister start over again, and I'm hoping everyone will listen this time rather than shout. And I know everybody wants to help him answer, but it's his turn to speak. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Despite consistent Conservative misinformation and disinformation on the matter, the simple mathematical fact is that the price on pollution returns more money to average families in the jurisdictions in which it applies than they pay uh, in this extra cost on pollution. That's how we can move forward on fighting climate change while supporting families through this, this, uh, this transformation of our economy and of our energy. These are the things that matter to Canadians. This is where we're continuing to put them first, not ideology. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Bailo Chambly. Mr. Speaker, we recently have had a debate on the priorities of this government, saying that we can sometimes not debate two things at once, but sometimes there are subjects that are more of a priority. Healthcare, for example, is cracking because of lack of funding. Sick people are on waiting lists, emergencies are overwhelmed. It's a national crisis. The Prime Minister is obstinate in keeping money whilst imposing conditions. Does the Prime Minister not agree that the health of Canadians is more important than his desire to remove powers from the provinces? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, Quebecers and Canadians expect a health care system that delivers results for them, that works for them in order to help them, help their families when they need it. However, we currently have healthcare systems in Canada that don't work to this high standard of expectation, and that is why we are here to work with these people and provinces, yes, with more money, but also whilst making sure that there are real results delivered for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Belo Chambly. My old father has said, well, what, what does he know about this? Quebec already administers an under-pressure healthcare system. It's the case everywhere in Canada. The pandemic came on top of existing pressures, and there is nothing, nothing at all, that says that a manager of Canada is better than a manager from Quebec or from Alberta. Creating standards, creating conditions, it's, it takes far too long. And so for the good of people, does not the Prime Minister not agree that, first of all, he should give 
money to the provinces and then he can open discussions. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, every year, we disperse tens of billions of dollars to the provinces for health care. We will continue to do so. The reality is that uh, our health care systems throughout the country do not work to the expectations of Canadians. That is the reason for which we are currently saying, let us work together. Let us work together to improve health care delivery service for uh, Canadians. More money, yes, but also with guarantees that we have Good results for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. To attack workers, but not just any workers, some of the lowest paid education workers in the classroom. And he knows that he's violating their charter rights. That's why he preemptively used the notwithstanding clause. Now, I've heard the Prime Minister's outrage, but that's simply not good enough. We know the Conservative leader and their party aren't going to stand up for workers, but will the Prime Minister say today in this chamber what he's going to do concretely to stand up for workers and protect their charter rights? Here, 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 here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, using the notwithstanding clause preemptively oh. to suspend workers' rights is wrong. To invoke the notwithstanding clause in a way that denies Canadians the right to collective bargaining before that bargaining has even reached an impasse is wrong. The clause must only be used in the most exceptional of circumstances. Uh, and like the leader of the NDP, I call out the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, who stands for rights and freedoms, supposedly, to actually condemn uh, the preemptive use of the notwithstanding clause to suspend people's fundamental rights and freedoms. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. It is eminently clear that the head of the Conservatives and the Conservatives won't stand to defend workers. You know, if you want to have a chat, then you could perhaps uh, go outside to have a chat, but not across the corridor, please. Just a little observation. Leader, or sorry, the Honourable Member for uh, Burnaby South. We know that the Conservative Party and the head of the Conservatives won't defend workers. But we have a question for the Prime Minister. It is not enough to simply raise concerns. What the Premier of Ontario has done is terrible. Now we need actions. The Prime Minister has the duty to act. Will he act? That is my question. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, using the notwithstanding clause in a preventive way in order to suspend the rights of workers is an error. Invoking a notwithstanding clause in order to stop Canadians from being able to collectively bargain before an impasse is an error. We will always stand and protect the rights of workers. We will always defend the fundamental rights of Canadians. Like my colleague from the NDP has said, it is a right shame to see that the leader of the Conservatives isn't defending the fundamental rights of people when he said that he is doing that. Calgary Forest Lawn. Prime Minister, nearly 50% of Canadians say their finances have worsened over the past year. For newcomers, that pain is leading them to leave Canada, with 30% of young immigrants planning to leave in the next two years. Narendra is an engineer who messaged me, saying liberal caused interest rate hikes mean his paycheck is now being eaten up by his mortgage. He's, he can't afford food or necessities and is planning to leave Canada. Will the Prime Minister stop his inflationary spending, stop raising taxes, and stop driving people like Narendra out of Canada? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, we know how important immigration is as a driver of our economic growth, as a counter to the, shortage, the labor shortages that we're facing across the country. That's why we've put forward an ambitious uh, immigration levels plan uh, that is uh, bringing in even more new Canadians so that they can ensure uh, they're, they're contributing to our economy, building a better lives uh, for themselves and their families, and meeting the needs of Canadian businesses and Canadian communities. We know there's more to do, but that's why we are making sure uh, that students like Narinder, engineers like Narinder, are able to continue to succeed in Canada to build a life for the future. Okay. Well, member for Calgary, Forrest Long. Narinder wants to leave Canada, not stay here because of his inflationary policies. Dang. And it only makes sense that a prime minister who spends a year's rent on a four-night hotel stay would think more inflation will address the inflationary crisis he created. It's like he wants to return to the days of his father, with out-of-control spending, Canadians' families' cupboards being bare, and when people were giving back their house keys back to the bank because they couldn't afford it. Yep. Canadians can't afford this costly coalition any longer. Will the Prime Minister stop the taxes, stop the inflationary spending, and stop his plans to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax? Yeah. You're right, Honourable Prime Minister. While the Conservatives engage in personal attacks and focus on me, we're going to continue to focus on helping Canadians, whether it's directly with a carbon uh, a price on pollution that is going to restore, put more money in the pockets of Canadians where it applies, whether it's moving forward with a GST rebate that's landing this Friday in, in many Canadians' households, or whether it's moving forward on low-income supports for renters and uh, support for dental care for kids, two initiatives that Conservatives continue to stand against. Mr. Speaker, Canadians deserve a government that continues to stand up for them, not Conservative rhetoric. The Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. The Prime Minister was warned about his reckless spending. He was told it would lead to interest rate hikes and inflation, and he laughed off those concerns. But now, because of Liberal inflation, millions of Canadians are using the food bank every month, and millions more are skipping meals because they can't afford to buy basic groceries. Groceries. They lay awake at night knowing they don't have the money to pay their bills, and this Prime Minister has the audacity to tell them they've never had it so good. When will he learn from his mistakes, cut his out-of-control spending, and stop raising taxes on Canadian families? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, while Conservatives are continuing to propose cuts, we're going to continue to be there for EI, we're going to continue to be there for CPP, we're going to continue to be there to deliver a, a, a price on pollution that puts more money in the pockets of Canadians where it applies. Mr. Speaker, we move forward with a GST rebate uh, that's going to help uh, 11 million households across this country starting to flow this Friday. The Conservatives reversed their position and chose to support it, which is good, but they still stand against support for low-income renters mm -hmm. and support so people can send their kids to the dentist. These are things that would really help Canadians. Why are they opposed? Chilliwack Hope. What we're opposed to is a Liberal plan and Liberal policies that have led to millions of Canadians every month using food banks, cutting back on meals because they can't afford groceries. Even the future Liberal leader, Mark Carney, has said that this inflationary crisis has principally been created in Canada. The Prime Minister can't blame others for the crisis he's created, and Canadians can't afford more of the same failed Liberal policies. So when will he stop making things worse, stop his out-of-control spending, and stop raising taxes on Canadian families? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the investments we're making in Canadians, whether it's with the GST rebate that's going to help, whether it's with low-income supports uh, for uh, renters uh, who need that extra support, or whether it's uh, making sure that all families can afford to send their kids to the dentist, are things that are going to help. Yes, there continue to be pressures because of global inflation, but the reality is we're going to continue uh, to be there for Canadians, and in uh, the economic statement we're putting forward tomorrow, people will see not just just supports for families, but supports for the kinds of jobs and opportunities they need in the decades to come. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, we all agree on one thing. Eating is a fundamental right, and we cannot put this aside. The issue is that numbers are concerning. 20% of families in Canada had to cut back on food, eating less because of inflation. Last month, 1.5 million Canadians turned to food banks. 
the Amélie Frédéric Support Group has said that there is twice as many requests for food assistance. Is the Prime Minister aware that his inflationary policies are directly shrinking the grocery, ba grocery baskets of all Canadian families? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we can clearly see how inflation, the global inflation is harming families in Canada, and that is the reason for which we are implementing tangible measures in order to help them. Measures like assisting dental care for children or rental care for low-income individuals. The Conservatives are against these two policies. Since 2015, with the investments we have made in families, we have allowed two million people to leave poverty behind throughout the country. These are investments in families, in seniors, in young people, in workers that we made. And most of these investments were opposed by the Conservatives, the Right Honourable, or uh, rather the member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, it's not only the world that has a problem here, it's because the Liberal government has never been able to control its spending over the past seven years. I'm not the only person who said this. The aspiring Liberal leader, Mark Carney, said that this was not an important inflation. It was a domestic inflation, Canadian inflation at the end of the day. So, Mr. Speaker, tomorrow the Minister for Finance, who also would like to be the leader of the Liberal Party, will give us a full economic update. Can she guarantee, can her Prime Minister guarantee, that there will be a freeze in expenditures and taxes? That will bring inflation down. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the Conservatives always propose austerity as a solution, but the reality is that investments, targeted investments in families, in seniors, in workers, is exactly what led to the growth we have seen over the past few years with reduction in poverty throughout the country. We are here to help people. We are here to invest and to build a stronger future and a greener future for everyone. Those are the choices we made, and the Conservatives are against every single time for lowering taxes for, middle, for the middle class, benefits for children. They're always against. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Mr. Speaker, I can no longer take the pretentious attitude of Ottawa saying that they're better than Quebec, that they know their files better than Quebec does. But the government is finally meeting with health care ministers, and despite the importance of the matter, it's not the Prime Minister who will be there, it's the, uh, it's the Minister for Health. Tomorrow we have a full economic update, and the mi health minister's meeting will happen after that. Is it to be understood that... Uh, a decision has already been made, and it's just political ploys at this point. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I think that Quebecers, like all Canadians, understand that uh, the solution for a healthcare system that does not work is not simply injecting more money. Yes, money will help, and we will be there to invest more money into healthcare, but it also takes collaborative work in order to ensure that results for Canadians are guaranteed so that are for Canadians, and that is exactly that upon which we will work. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Collaborative work, that's for now, is just delay after delay after delay to then impose conditions upon us. In Quebec, even emergency service corridors are full. Surgery waiting lists are interminable. Real people, real sick people, people are suffering right now. I've, I know parents, and I, well, I hope they doesn't know parents, but I know parents that are scared that their kids might co simply commit suicide. Should we not put healthcare at risk for political points? So the Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, I totally agree that politics should not enter into this debate, and that is why we are saying, yes, people should have access to a family physician. People shouldn't be stuck in corridors in emergency services. And it's not just money that will magically solve everyone's problems overnight. It's what will solve the problem is fundamental changes, fundamental improvements, and we have to do this collab with, in collaboration with provinces and territories, and we must put Canadians at the heart of our deliverable results, and that is exactly the conversation we are having with Ministers of Health throughout the country. The Honourable Head of the Opposition. Prime Minister and their costly coalition vote to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax 
on people's home heating bills. The Prime Minister treated himself to a luxurious vacation uh, and a wonderful night of singing in a palatial hotel lobby, one of the swankiest hotels on planet Earth. He then spent $6,000 per night on a single hotel room. Who stayed in that room? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, while the Conservatives continue to focus on me, we're going to stay focused on supporting Canadians, whether that's with measures the Conservatives oppose to deliver rental supports for low-income Canadians, or whether that's to make sure that all Canadians can send their kids to the dentist. But we heard uh, the Conservative leader for months talking about freedoms for Canadians, talking about rights and freedoms, and now that a government is preemptively blocking Canadians' fundamental rights and freedoms, not a whisper from this so-called freedom fighter, Mr. Speaker. When is he going to condemn the use of the notwithstanding clause? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Nice try. Nice try. He's very clever, but here he, a moment ago, who stayed in the $6,000 a room hotel, uh, $6,000 a night hotel room? And he said that I was focusing on him. Well, I guess that we got our answer then. Well, now it's clear that he want to talk about anything else to avoid taking a blame for having spent that money on himself while the Canadians are suffering. Can he confirm it was him that had that night? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, why Conservatives continue to play rhetorical games, the reality is Canadians need a Conservative Party that stands up for them, which is simply something they're not getting. They're not stepping up on rental care, rental supports for low-income renters. They're not stepping up on dental care uh, for kids who need it. And they're not even standing up for the fundamental rights and freedoms that the Leader of the Opposition made a full campaign out of, and now he's nowhere to be seen on standing up for Canadians' fundamental rights and freedoms. Will he condemn the notwithstanding clause preemptive use? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This from the guy, this from the guy that robbed a record amount of Canadian workers' paychecks when he imposed the highest inflation in 40 years on them. And there was no negotiation for workers. In fact, they all took an across-the-board pay cut without ever giving their permission. And now, his posi the position of his government is that they should have their pay cap. The governor of the Bank of Canada told CEOs that there should be no pay hike for Canadian workers to compensate them for this Prime Minister's inflation. Does he agree with the governor of the Bank of Canada that workers don't deserve a pay hike? Yes or no? The right Honourable Prime Minister. He's actually trying to pretend he's standing up for workers right now when he is refusing to condemn a suspension of their most fundamental rights to collective bargaining. Mr. Speaker, workers' ability to negotiate a, a, better, a better future for themselves and their families is core to this, can, this country's middle class success. Why is he not condemning this attack on fundamental rights and freedom? I see the emotions are running a little bit high, so I'm going to ask everybody to take a deep breath. Everybody, order. Everybody look at me and take a deep breath, all together now. Okay, now we're going to calm down. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I am condemning the attack this Prime Minister has undertaken on Canadian workers mm -hmm. by giving them the go. highest inflation in 40 years, eating up their paychecks so that they cannot afford food. It is this Prime Minister who has sent 1.5 million Canadians Shameful. to the food bank in the month of March. 
This Prime Minister who's given them record credit card debt. This Prime Minister who has forced one in five of them to skip meals because they can't afford to eat. And now his governor of the Bank of Canada says that those workers don't deserve a raise. I condemn those comments. Will he? Here, here, here. Right on. One of the most fundamental oh, rights no, available for workers no, is to negotiate no, their pay no, and their working conditions. Are you done, I guess, is the question. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, from the beginning, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the most fundamental rights available to workers in this country is the ability uh, to fight for better, uh, better rights, better opportunities, better pay, better working conditions. And that happens at the bargaining table, Mr. Speaker. What has happened is they have been stripped of that right to bargain, to negotiate, to talk about a better future for themselves and their families by the preemptive use of a measure designed to suspend and override their fundamental rights and freedoms. But Mr. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition refuses, has refused six times, to condemn that in this House. Well, member for Burnaby South. Canadian families are struggling with the rising cost of energy, whether it's putting gas in their cars or paying for their home heating. All the while, these oil and gas companies are raking in record profits, something the Biden administration is referring to as war profiteering, and frankly, it is. What's this Liberal government's response? To put even more public money in the pockets of these highly profitable companies. When will the Prime Minister take a stand? and protect workers and make these wealthy companies pay what they owe on their windfall of profits and invest that into helping Canadians pay their energy bills. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, with putting a price on pollution right across the country that puts more money in the pockets of families uh, in jurisdictions where it applies, uh, we're actually sending clear price signals uh, to industry and to private sector that they have to invest more in decarbonization. This is something that we're uh, in, uh, focusing on ensuring that these record profits from the oil and gas industry go into investing in decarbonization, go into uh, CCUS technology uh, to decarbonize, invest in better opportunities and jobs for the future while we fight climate change across the country. For Burnaby South. In the last election, this Prime Minister made some really big promises on health care. made big promises to improve long-term care. He made big promises on mental health care. But he's, fall, he's completely missing in action when it comes to the premiers of this country requesting a meeting on dealing with the health care crisis. When will the Prime Minister actually respond to the crisis that we're dealing with and deliver on the promises that he made? The Honour Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we heard clearly from Canadians from coast to coast to coast that they want access to family doctors. We heard clearly from families from coast to coast to coast that they need to see an end to the backlog, that they need better help for mental, uh, mental uh, access to mental health services. These are things that we are busy working with the provinces on, and we're going to be delivering, yes, with more funds, but also with clearer outcomes for Canadians. Canadians deserve a health care system that actually delivers for them. We know, as the chief, uh, as the head of the K CMA has said, that you can't just put money into a broken system. You need to fix the system. That's what we're doing. Honourable member for Surrey Centre. Mr. Speaker, immigration isn't just good for our economy, it's essential. And Canadians agree, according to a recent Environics survey, 85% of Canadians agree that overall immigration has a positive impact on our economy and our country. That's right. My riding of Surrey Centre is embracing immigration to not only reunite with families, but also to ensure the future of our community. 
Mr. Speaker, could the Prime Minister please update us on our government's plan for immigration? Good question. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Surrey Centre for his question, his hard work and his advocacy on the immigration file. Yesterday, the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship tabled our immigration levels plan focused on attracting skilled workers who will contribute to our economy. Our plan will help cement Canada's place among the world's top destinations for talent and fulfilling Canada's humanitarian commitments. We know that immigration grows the economy. That's exactly what we're continuing to do. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverbend. Mr. Speaker, a new poll is out that suggests one in five Canadians are out of money due to inflation. This means parents can't afford to feed their kids, pay their bills, and they're terrified where their next paycheck will come from. And this Prime Minister just keeps making it worse. Canadians cannot afford this costly coalition. So will this Prime Minister stop his inflationary spending and stop raising taxes? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I wonder what the member opposite's constituents would say if they actually heard him saying that support for families who can't send their kids to the dentist is inflationary. That extra support uh, for low-income renters uh, to be able to afford their rent is inflationary spending. That's the excuse the Conservatives are giving for not being there to help families send their kids to the dentist, to not being there to help low-income renters. These are things that will tangibly support Canadians, like our GST rebate uh, that's arriving in, in mailboxes as of this Friday. These are things that help. Why aren't they helping? Well, member for Edmonton Riverbend. Mr. Speaker, I can't repeat in this House what my constituents have said about that guy. <laughs> These families are in their darkest hours. And now even future Liberal leader Mark Carney has stated, and I quote, it's not all imported inflation. In fact, most of it is now domestically generated inflation. That's how out of touch this Prime Minister actually is, Mr. Speaker. So will he stop his inflationary spending and stop raising taxes? Yeah! The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we will not stop ensuring that low-income families get extra help with the pay uh, with uh, with their rental costs. We will not prevent Canadians uh, from sending their kids to the dentist when they couldn't afford it before. These are measures we're putting forward that will help in a meaningful way millions of families across the country. And yet, Conservative politicians continue to stand against rental and dental support for Canadians. Mr. Speaker. If they really wanted to help Canadians in their ridings and across the country, they would step up and back our plan on rental and dental. Well, member for Dorn Thornhill. Here's the problem that these Liberals don't understand. The Prime Minister can't spend his way out of the inflation that he himself has created. $6,000 a night for a fancy hotel room for the Prime Minister is three months of rent for Canadians who can't afford it. $12,000 a month for groceries at his house, while 1.5 million Canadians visited a food bank last month. How can the Prime Minister pretend to understand the pain that he's inflicting on, on Canadians? while simultaneously raising their taxes. Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. In this House, we've put forward measures that the Conservatives ended up choosing to support that's good on them, uh, to deliver uh, GST rebates to Canadians that will start landing this Friday. Why will they not reverse their position on sending dental supports so families can actually send their kids to the dentist or support for low-income renters? These are things that these Conservatives continue to oppose. Concrete help that will deliver uh, for Canadian families right across the country that they stand, cross their arms and say, no, we're not helping Canadians. Well, on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we will. Well, member for Thornhill. The Prime Minister is raising taxes on seniors trying to heat their home. He's raising taxes on families trying to buy groceries because he gave his Liberal buddy $250 million uh, for ventilators that we didn't use because he spent $54 million on an app we didn't need, that didn't work, that should have cost a quarter million and could have been built in a weekend. 
because he gave $133,000 to an anti-Semite and then covered it up for a month. He's breaking the bank for his Liberal friends while Canadians can't break even. When will he just stop? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Conservatives need to stop with the misinformation and the disinformation. The price on pollution delivers more money to most families in jurisdictions where it applies uh, than it costs them in extra costs on pollution. The fact of the matter is our initiatives to fight climate change actually not only fights climate change but puts more money back in the pockets of families that need it. That focus is exactly how we're growing the economy, supporting Canadians and building a better future for everyone. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. I'm wondering, Mr. Speaker, why the Prime Minister thinks that he's nicer, more competent than Quebec. Is it because of the 1982 Constitution? Is it because of the fiscal imbalance? Is it because of the power to spend? It seems like he's telling Quebecers that they're not good enough and that him and his buddies, they're better. I get the impression that he confuses collaboration and holding sick people hostage. So I'd like to challenge him, Mr. Speaker, that he can name one thing, one thing in health care that Canada uh, does that Quebec is not capable of doing. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, all Quebecers are also Canadians. And uh, uh, his uh, question as such is completely illogical. Now, look, all jokes aside, Mr. Speaker, Quebecers, like all Canadians, deserve a health care system that works. All that we're saying as the federal government is that, yes, we are going to be there to provide more money, but we need to make sure that there are improvements in the health care systems across the country. Improvements which are not being called for by Ottawa, but they're being called for by Quebecers, Canadians, who are worried about their seniors and about those they love. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, for me, being Canadian is like uh, 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 swearing an oath to the king. It's because I have to. You know, uh, discussions, centralization, etc., apparently that takes time. Meanwhile, doctors are waiting. Nurses are waiting. Patients are waiting. Parents are waiting. Young people in distress are waiting. What do you say to people who are waiting for their own money to go into health care because the Prime Minister thinks that he's better than anyone else. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, families in Quebec who are waiting for services in health care aren't waiting for money from the federal government. They're waiting for health care services that are provided by the government of Quebec. They're waiting for improvements in their system. They're waiting, like all Canadians, for results, concrete results in their health care systems. It's a system that's broken and which needs to be improved. Mr. Speaker, we are going to be there to invest more money in health care across the country, but we need to work with the provinces to make sure that those improvements are going to be real and concrete for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Fundy Royal. Mr. Speaker, the National Sex Offender Registry is used by police to track and apprehend dangerous predators. Until last week's Supreme Court of Canada ruling, registration of sex offenders in the National Sex Offender Registry was mandatory. Will the Prime Minister do today what the Justice Minister would not do yesterday and commit to victims, to survivors, that his government will do whatever is necessary to make sure that sex offenders are again listed in the sex offender registry. Yes or no? What Canadians need is legislation that goes after criminals, that protects our communities, and that holds up in court. It's crystal clear that the Conservative Party's supposed tough-on-crime legislation over 10 years failed to do just that. It's being struck down in court, and it's not protecting our communities. So we will not take advice or lessons from this failed Conservative Party's failed approaches. Canadians deserve real solutions that will deliver to protect our communities, to protect our kids, and stay the course and hold up in court. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. 
Oh. Mr. Speaker, that answer is not nearly good enough for survivors of sexual predators. Right. He's going to have to do way better than that for That's survivors, right. Mr. Speaker. And right. crime in this country is up 32 percent, with over 124,000 more violent crimes last year than when he first became prime minister seven years ago. Clearly, his approach is failing. So how many more people in our communities are going to have to get beaten and mugged and murdered because of his soft on crime policies? When's he going to change course, take action and clean up our streets, Mr. Speaker? How many more people have to get hurt before we see results from this prime minister? The right honorable prime minister. Supposed tough on crime laws passed by these conservatives in the past decade need to be struck down by the courts before they understand that their approach is failing Canadians, is failing victims, is failed as failed communities. We're moving forward with real protections for Canadians that will hold up in court, that will keep people safe, that will continue to put victims of crime and reduce the number of victims of crime in this country by keeping communities safe in real, tangible ways ways that actually will hold up in court, Mr. Speaker. No, no. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles Mr. Speaker, I recently met with victims groups, racialized groups, and police associations in Montreal to discuss the increased violence in the streets of Montreal, and they were all unanimous. The proposals in Bill C-5 are a mistake. Eliminating mandatory prison sentences for robbery with a firearm, that's a mistake. And all these groups are saying that they say it doesn't make any sense. Right now, the bill is in the Senate. Can the Prime Minister call his friends in the Senate and ask them to vote against this and cancel Bill C-5? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the measures in that bill will increase the maximum sentences for the worst crimes to make sure that there are real consequences. This is approach, an approach that we are taking to make sure that criminals have real consequences while recognizing that the best way to protect our communities is with bills which uh, will not be struck down by the courts. That's something that the Conservatives haven't understood because we continue to see bills that they have proposed be struck down by the courts because they don't protect Canadians or communities. The Honourable Member for dorval la chine -la -Salle. Mr. Speaker, a free and independent press is one of the pillars of our democracy. It is absolutely fundamental, and I believe it is our duty to protect it. That protection starts with ensuring that they are paid properly for the work that they do. Can the Prime Minister please update us on what this government is doing to ensure the vitality of our local media? Thank you. Right. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Dorval la Chine la Salle for her important question and for her very hard work. I agree with her, and that's why I call on Conservative members to stop lining up behind the web giants and instead to support our bill. I understand that the Conservative leader prefers not having to uh, ask, uh, to answer questions, you know, uh, given his, uh, his support for Bitcoin and his misogynistic web tags, but we support a free and independent press which holds politicians to account. Honourable Member for Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A parent's worst nightmare is a sick child, and a shortage of infant and children's Tylenol, Motrin, and Advil from earlier this summer is turning into a full-blown crisis. Parents are now having to choose between taking their sick kid to an overcrowded emergency room or crossing the border to the U.S. where there are no shortages on these drugs just to get basic medicine to bring down their kids' fever and relieve pain. When does the Prime Minister intend to do something about this crisis? Yeah! Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, we hear the concerns from parents on the supply of children's pain, fever and meds. And as a parent, I can completely understand. That's why we're committed to ensuring that all families have access to the essential medicines their children need. Health Canada has been in communication with manufacturers, pharmacists and provinces and territories to ensure mitigation measures are in place. Our main priority will always be the health and safety of Canadians and all options are on the table. The Honourable Member for Megantic L'Erable. Mr. Speaker, for a month now we've been warning the Prime Minister about this situation, but the Prime Minister always, you know, has an excuse ready to justify his inability to act even for young uh, children who are sick. And as a grandparent, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm very 
it, it makes me sick to my stomach this situation. A month ago, Health Canada was asked to do something so that uh, mothers and fathers could have access to medication for their children. Uh, and medication the children want to take, Mr. Speaker. Why, once again, is he hiding behind excuses to avoid giving children who are sick the medication they need? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are hearing the concerns of parents uh, when it comes to the shortage of uh, pain medication for children. We will continue to make sure that all families have access to essential medication for their children when they need it. We are going to fight this shortage. Health Canada is in communication with uh, uh, pharmacists and the makers of these medications and the provinces and territories to ensure that measures uh, are in place. And our priority remains this, the health and the well-being of Canadians, and we are looking at all options. They're all on the table. Mr. Speaker, the reality is the Liberals' out-of-control spending makes life more expensive for all Canadians. Half can't put aside savings. Home heating costs will double this winter. More Canadians already had to use food banks in one single month than ever before in Canadian history. For years, our new Conservative leader has warned that the NDP Liberals' costly coalitions, inflationary deficits would force Canadians to have to pay the bill. So tomorrow, will the Prime Minister finally give Canadians a break and stop his tax hikes and reckless spending. Yeah. Honourable Prime Minister. Except, Mr. Speaker, that the Conservative Party has decided that it needs to oppose supports for parents to send their kids to the dentist. Except, Mr. Speaker, that the Conservative Party has decided to oppose giving a $500 top-up to low-income renters across this country to help with the rising costs of everything. Mr. Speaker, we're facing global inflation, yes, but there are things we can do to make uh, it easier for families, things like childcare, which we're moving forward on despite Conservative opposition, things like the CCB, things like the GST uh, credit, and dental and rental, which they continue to oppose. Honourable Member for Whitby. Mr. Speaker, the Sustainable Finance Forum is on Parliament Hill this week. We will have over 60 speakers, hundreds of participants will attend virtual sessions as well as events on climate finance and social finance. As we're all looking at ways to make the economy more sustainable, I'd like to ask the Prime Minister about the progress our government is making to help Canadian businesses achieve both growth and sustainability. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate the member for Whitby for his question and especially for the hard work he does, not just for his constituents, but for all Canadians. From climate change to inequality, the world is facing big challenges. But together, we can drive investment to create jobs in a net zero economy, build affordable housing, and make sure everyone has a real and fair chance at success. As a government, we launched our first $5 billion green bond and released Canada's green bond framework. Framework. We also created the Sustainable Finance Action Council, and we will continue to build an economy that works for all Canadians. Okay. Member for Burnaby South. 87% of Indigenous households in Canada live in urban, rural, and northern regions outside their traditional territories. 87%. Despite this, the Liberals are only committing $300 million to address the urgent and imminent needs for urban, rural and Indigenous communities housing. This is so far nowhere near enough. Will the Prime Minister commit to increasing the funding, the interim funding, to a level that responds to the urgency and the desperate need that the community has? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the housing challenges faced by Canadians right across the country are significant, but nowhere more significant uh, than in vulnerable urban, indigenous, uh, northern and remote uh, areas. That's why we've put forward record amounts of $300 million uh, direct investment to support and grow uh, housing supply uh, in uh, those areas. And we know there will be more to do, but we need to make sure we are delivering results for Canadians, and that's exactly what we're what we're focused on. 
Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, in the midst of a climate emergency, oil and gas companies are sacrificing our kids' future for their corporate greed. Shame. In the past nine months, Imperial Oil made $6.2 billion in profit, almost four times last year. We cannot expect the arsonists to put out this fire. On the eve of the 27th annual global climate negotiations, will the PM finally eliminate subsidies to oil and gas companies and replace them with a windfall tax on these excess profits? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, a number of years ago, Canada committed alongside other like-minded nations to eliminate uh, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies by 2025. But Mr. Speaker, that's not good enough. The climate emergency means we need to act faster and stronger. That's why we're pulling forward by two years uh, until 2023 uh, the need to uh, eliminate inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. We've already eliminated a significant number of them. We're going to continue to do it while ensuring uh, that fossil fuel companies invest in decarbonization and in better jobs uh, for everyone for the coming years. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. We, ha we have uh, two points of orders. Uh, we'll start with the honourable member for Hamilton Centre. Mr. Speaker, there